Welcome back to Believe in Badgers on the Believe Network, presented by BetOnline.ag and Oak Ridge Wealth Management. I'm Matt Perkins, joined as always by Badger legend, the Hebrew hammer himself, Matt Bernstein. Bernie, how are we doing today? Dude, we're good, man. Every day is a holiday on the podcast with your beautiful face, Matt Perkins. Uh, we have, you know, one of the best Badgers uh, and now Buffalo Bills, although we've been talking a lot of smack about fantasy because I took half the team. Um, uh, but, dude, Always a good time talking Badgers, talking NFL, talking just basically everything. Absolutely. Yes. And as Bernie alluded to, we have former Badger, Buffalo Bills left guard, David Edwards, returning to the program. Great to see you again. Appreciate you guys having me. It's always good to, to get on the pod with you guys. Obviously, uh, for those of you who've been tuning in for a while, uh, this is episode 261, Bernie. So people have been tuning in for a while now, but uh, I'm warning you now. This is going to be a Bill-centric episode. You are going to have to indulge me today uh, because we don't get a lot of Bills. And so, Man. Bernie, I know your Jets are crap this year. This might be rubbing salt in the wound, but, you know, it's going to be fun no matter what. Before Dude, we get into it, though, one Not enough my- salt. I've been have salt in my wounds for 41 years of being a Jets fan. Except for one year, we made it to the playoffs for one game. No, you made the AFC Championship twice under Rex Ryan. Yeah, who can remember that? I don't even remember it. Well, <laughs> it's because you were right out of college. I don't think you're remembering a lot of what was happening when you were about 25. So oh, touche, touche. Touche. I, I had season tickets one of those years, actually. Wasn't Jimmy playing for them at that point? Yeah. I was sitting next to Jimmy's wife when he um tore his ACL. Ooh. That was brutal. Mm. Yeah. That's yeah. like the not the game I wanted to be at sitting next to his wife. You know, because they call you like within five seconds. And they're like, come to the training room and i was like oh no i just went home i was like i, I have nothing else to be here for like yeah, i was brutal. so sad that's brutal we don't want to start on a low point matt Perkins. no we don't we <laughs> want to start on a high point by reminding everyone tuning in that we continue to be presented by betonline.ag the world's most trusted site for all of your online wagering needs from the earliest odds to in-game live betting bet online provides you with all the action and ability to watch the games as they happen with the largest selection of odds on everything from football nba nhl and much more head on over to bet online today to get in on the action with america's most trusted site for online wagering bet online the game starts here and of course we are proudly and continue to be presented by our main man chris anacetti and his team over at oak bridge wealth management if you are a pro future pro or ncaa athlete with nil deals chris is the man that you need to connect with to get your money right over at oak bridge chris and his team of professionals will uh, create a comprehensive financial plan to set you up to navigate your lifestyle and future market conditions oak bridge specializes in wealth management for professional athletes they understand all the pressures that athletes face every single day chris and his his team will set you up with a bespoke plan to make your money work for you off the field so you can focus on what you do best, perform on the field. Get in touch with Chris on Instagram at OakbridgeWM underscore Anacetti. That's OakbridgeWM underscore A-N-I-C-E-T-E. Or visit their website at OakbridgeWealthMGMT.com. Chris Anacetti and Oakbridge Wealth Management. Get your money right. Dave, uh, how many guys have you seen now in your, I think, what is this, your sixth year in the league? Uh yep. How many guys have you seen struggle with getting their money right? Um, you know what? I actually think there's um, – the NFLPA does a pretty good job of, of bringing financial literacy and kind of like educating guys when they first come in. You know, hey, you're going to get some you know pretty good money um, in your rookie contract. And they changed the pay structure from when I was a rookie. You only got paid in season. So now it's through pretty much the full off season. So there's probably like a six to eight week period where you don't. Um, but I think that's really helped a lot of guys kind of um, have awareness to, all right, I can, I can put this away. I can budget this. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's been a, a very good thing um, really since my rookie year on that the NFL NFL PA does a good job of, of educating guys. David, you still, when you show up, and you get into that parking lot that first time, uh, you definitely look around. You're like, Oh my goodness. There are some yeah. really beautiful cars here. No doubt. <laughs> no <laughs> I, doubt. I drove in my, my Outback Subaru Outback station wagon at like a hundred thousand miles on it. And 
these guys had yeah. some of the nicest cars that were tricked out, painted, you know, uh, it, now I think you should enjoy yourself. Totally. But I also think as Chris Anasetti would tell you, you got to save for the rest of your life football side totally. window and then it closes. And then what are you gonna do for 40 years after that? And that, yeah. I think, yeah, you gotta, you gotta be able to have fun. Like you work so hard to be able to, to play, stay healthy, um, earn the, earn the money that you're making. But at the same time, you know, that's like, you're saying it's not really forever. So how do you maximize kind of your ability to save and and set up your future while also kind of enjoying yourself? And that's like the balance that guys have to find. Wait, David, did you, you don't have to tell us, but if you, if you want to, did you like have one of like a splurge moment? Did you buy anything? Like, uh, you're like, wow, this is really cool, but I shouldn't have done it. No, I never really had one of those, you know, like, um, some guys, like some guys I know, like they, they do some really cool stuff. Like they've, they've, they've saved for whatever they're trying to, to buy. It's kind of like they're present to themselves for all the hard work that they've, uh, that, you know, they've gone through to, to get into that. Um, for me, the one thing I did, but I did buy was I bought myself a nice watch. Like I felt like, um, for whatever reason, like my family, um, my mom and dad, my, my uncles, like they always had like a a watch on. And, um, so I kind of grew up like with that, if that makes sense. And so, um, I felt like, uh, I, I, you know, saved enough and, and had a a good enough like position to be able to like splurge a little bit. That was like my one thing. Good for you. (laughs) <laughs> that's, a good, no, that, that's a good purchase. I see a lot of guys. I have I have a coworker who just got a big promotion and he bought himself a watch because of it. You know, he with, with, with like the bonus that he got. So like, yeah. I definitely I definitely feel that. Like it's a uh, watches, especially at this point. Are I don't know we can go down a long tangent about watches. I want to though get back to the football field because one <laughs> of the many reasons that we brought you on here, Dave, to talk about today was because I, I want to get into offensive line play in like 2024 in football college and professional right now obviously you know one of the other reasons to talk to you about this that's so interesting is because you've played every position along the offensive line and you i mean you went from high school quarterback to all the way now to playing left guard right and you play yeah. you know tackle all this kind of good stuff you entered wisconsin in 2014 as a freshman um and uh you know you at that point, Wisconsin's obviously running like very pro style, very hard hitting run first. Now in the league, everything is about pass blocking first. It seems how, how have you seen the you know offensive line change in your sort of 10 years at high level football? And what do you think today then I guess as a follow-up is the most important thing for young offensive linemen in order to get like their base set to play at that level? What a loaded question. Yeah, I know. Um, That's what I mean. I know. Starting you off with a big one. I know. Um, so when I first got to Wisconsin, it was a lot of um, heavier set formations, heavier personnel. Um, there wasn't, at least in 2015, there wasn't a ton of um, scheme variants. I think that we were pretty much a gap team. Um, we had a little bit of like that inside zone, but a lot of downhill action. Um when we got Jonathan Taylor became more of like an outside zone scheme, um, still gapping and power stuff. And then when I got into the NFL, um, I would say it's so difficult because these guys are so good on the D line now to be able to physically move people off the ball. Like we were able to do in college. So we ran more mid zone schemes where it's you're trying to kind of move people laterally while also getting displacement off the ball. Um, because it is really difficult to get just a ton of movement consistently in the run game, specifically with like gap and and power stuff. Um, but I actually think that there's been kind of a transition within the last probably year or two. I think you're starting to see like a lot more heavier personnel in the NFL to run the football, more jumbo tight end stuff, um, fullbacks, more tight, you know, like I think that there's a premium now on being able to run the football to kind of alleviate stress off quarterbacks. So it's not so much all on their shoulders. So, um, but pass blocking, you you think that's a product of like a lot of defenses moving to too high, like all the time. I think defenses are trying to make you go the long way, meaning like instead of 
you know, you're keeping a cap on the defense. So there's no explosives. There's no big plays down the field. I think defenses are trying to test people to see how patient they are in some way to, Hey, can you sustain a 10 plus play drive and score, you know, a touchdown, maybe even a field goal. Like, do you have that patience? So um, I do think it's a product of that, but circling back to the pass pro stuff, like, and if what I've kind of like learned um, playing in the NFL is like situational football is kind of the king. Like how good are you in the red zone? How good are you on third down short yardage? So can you have kind of your full playbook available to you in those situations to be able to say, all right, can we, you know, pass pro in third and two, maybe we get like man to man coverage. We like that matchup. We can exploit them in this way, whatever. So, and then obviously in third down, that's like when you get the exotic fronts and pressures and looks, and you're kind of able to decipher, all right, we got to go to this dude. Don't block this guy. Um, But I think like the quarterbacks, they're so good. Like Josh is so good now at being able to kind of pick apart and decipher like, okay, Hey, I know the rule based off this protection is to go to this player. I don't think he's coming. Let's go to this guy. So a lot of situational football, I think is trying to uncover who's coming, who's not. um, And how do we exploit our matchups? And then lastly, the, the advice to linemen is versatility period. So if you want to play, you know, and like, I can, I can think back to um, uh, hearing about Tanner Bordellini and his position flex, he was a center, a guard and a tackle. Like, that is so valuable to NFL teams or college teams to be able to have position flex, you know, within the offense and in the offensive line, because like you only dress eight guys on game day in the NFL. So, you know, you got your starting five, then you have a backup interior guy, a swing tackle, and then maybe a a guy that can do it all. So being able to have that position flex, I think is, is critical. So, so David, you, you're in your sixth year. Have you seen, you know, we've gone through, that's basically a generation of a kid's life in college. Have you seen like the the style change of line play from you, from you at six years in the NFL to like guys coming in fresh? It depends. Like, I think that um, as a whole, like if you look at the, if you look at the college game now, there's more spread offenses up tempo, mm-hmm not a lot of run scheme variants where, you know, like my last year at Wisconsin, we ran pin pull, we ran outside zone, we ran gap, we ran power, we ran inside zone. Like we had a, a variety of different run schemes that we, that were available to us because we had such a special back. We wanted to be able to like change the, you know, the points of, of pressure for defenses. Now I see guys coming in and I feel like, there isn't a ton of run scheme variants. They might be just an inside zone scheme or just a gap team, Mm. gun run, whatever it may be. And so in the NFL too, and in college, I'm sure that that menu of schemes is shrinking in some ways because you're just trying to find what you're best at. You know, it's kind of like a, an argument to be made. Like, do you have all these different run schemes available to you? Or do you kind of narrow it down to maybe two or three that you're just really good at? So um, I I wouldn't put it so much on the players. Like it's hard to be able to say, oh, the players are, he's a gap, you know, scheme guy, or he's a zone scheme guy Um, because maybe that's all they ran in college. So I, I, I always think that, you know, like we don't give enough credit to some of these guys. Like I think that they can, they can, they can learn and, and, develop into new systems once they get into college or in the NFL. I've really seen that with your teammate Osiris Torrance, because what he was running at Louisiana and Florida is completely different to what you guys have been doing in Buffalo under Joe Brady. And I think he's taken a huge step forward here. Uh, What is this in his second year in the league? But you talked about that positional versatility. I want to go back to that because you were playing jumbo tight end last year. (laughs) So what was that like for you, right? Because you had been starting on a Super Bowl championship team, you signed with Buffalo and, you know, you didn't get the chance to start 
immediately, but you're in a lot of packages. What was your mindset going into that? And then what was it like to play that jumbo tight end position? Cause I imagine that can be a lot of fun. Um, gosh, it was so much fun it, <laughs> to, you know, like I didn't have that, that role kind of evolved as the season went on, which was really cool. Um, like I would say that, um, as I kind of got deeper into the season, I felt like my role was like pretty substantial within our offense. Like we, I, I think in the playoffs, I bet you I had about like 20 plays a game, which is, I feel like a decent amount for a jumbo mm-hmm. tight end. But, um, I signed with Buffalo, got the opportunity to kind of compete. Um, once I knew I was going to be kind of that sixth man, um, I really embraced that role as that jumbo tight end and kind of the sixth eyes for that starting group. Like it was, it was so much fun to be able to see those guys play, compete, come off on the sideline. What are you guys seeing? Here's what I'm seeing. So Tromer, what he's seeing, et cetera. So to be able to kind of like, um, to be able to kind of do all of that uh, last year was just so much fun. Like, and I, I really felt like I made uh, an impact in some ways, like, you know, toward the latter part of the season, being able to come in and do, you know, my job to help the offense. That's it. Oh, go ahead, Burn. Please. I was saying, connecting it kind of to the Badgers, right? You guys are doing six linemen pretty much on some, on, on some plays. The Badgers only usually do five. Can you just talk like to someone who like my mom, who might not know really what that means, how important is putting another guy in the box who can block for the running? Back? Huge. So I think you, you know, we talked a little bit about that too high defense, right? I think the trend to go to heavier personnel or to heavier, uh, you know, run formations is to, to get them out of that. So you're able to exploit single high defenses and pass game and, and uh, play action stuff. So when like when you watch Wisconsin, when they have kind of that lighter box of linemen, five people, um, um, and you know, kind of compare that to what we do with a six, you know, jumbo tight end or even 12 personnel, two tight ends, you're really trying to present to the defense like, hey, we are run- trying to run the football. We want you to get out of that shell defense and and maybe blitz or whatever to exploit you know, that, that coverage contour. So, um, you know, and I think too, like when you watch Wisconsin, like I I look back to this past game with Oregon, I think it was the drive that they kicked a field goal in the second half. They ran the ball, I think like every play in that drive. And it was like, you know, more heavy. I think they had a tight end involved and it was, that mid zone scheme or inside zone zone scheme that they were running and they were crushing Oregon. And then it got to like, you, you look at like what we did, like um, uh, against the chiefs, like, you know, we, we ran a lot of like 12 personnel, heavy personnel stuff to be able to run the football a little bit different, but you're trying to basically, all right, if you're going to play this shell defense, we're going to run the football. Until you get out of that shell defense, we're going to run the football. And you've got to be efficient in running the football, you know, to be able to continue to do that. That's that, that was really interesting because I was I was very curious going to that Chiefs game because Chiefs have an incredible run defense, right? Like one of the best in the league. Steve Spagnuolo has always been one of the best defensive coordinators. But, you know, I was talking with one of my buddies, Alec, who was here on the show with us last week, Bernie, also a Bills fan, Western New York guy, um, of course. And uh, we, we, were ta- we were talking before the game, though. I was like, I think the Bills are going to go super heavy in this game, right? To try to counteract. He's like, no, they have so much run defense. So it was really interesting, that cat and mouse game, right, that you're talking yeah. about with trying to get the defense defense to do the one thing you know they don't want to do right which is you know commit an extra guy into the box and then you can sort of exploit that exploit the one-on-one matchups on the outside um i want to talk a little bit more about that game specifically though and um because that was obviously the game of the year for a lot of people uh in the nfl um and obviously the big play of the game the fourth and two play uh uh down at the end and uh I want you to just kind of take us through here. Like what, what is going on? Like in your head in like, what are you seeing as this happens? 
Fakes left, now taken off. Going to run for it, he got it! And there he goes! Inside the 10, the 5, oh, the play of the year in the NFL! So what what is going through your head at this point? Like what's like, do you know that he's probably going to take off? Like, just like walk us through this play. First off, how awesome is Jim Nance? I mean, <laughs> gosh, that guy's incredible. Uh, <laughs> so we had called a protection where we're going to slide to the boundary in this play. And then um, I'm communicating with Dion to, to be able to say, Hey, we're going to go to this guy. Cause they're kind of all hovering around the line of scrimmage. Um, and so I'm, you know, it's a basically a three for two situation. Um, cause I, we didn't really think that they were going to blitz on this play, um, based on this look. So, um, I'm, you know, looking to check Dion. There's like kind of that internal clock in your head, making sure that it's kind of secure. And then you're like, is he scrambling? Is he not? So I start to kind of look and run toward the right, which is where the the nose guard was playing. And I see Josh kind of zip by him. And my th- first thought was like, you know, he got the first down and then you're kind of like, Oh shit, he's going to score. <laughs> like, so in that moment, it was one of the best plays I've ever seen, you know, a player make. And he's just, he's such a badass. Um, when, when the ball's in his hands and his, he's able to, make plays with his feet, his arm. Like he's, he's truly one-on-one. Listen, as, as a fantasy owner of Josh Allen um, <laughs> or manager, uh, I am very happy with that play. Let me oh. tell you, I won this week off of strictly his play and somehow Jameis Winston's play last week was outrageous too. But <clears throat> um, you scored like almost 30 points as a quarterback. It's pretty good. Love that. That's amazing. <laughs> so, like, you know, obviously, you know, a lot of people talk about this game last week. What was, you know, the emotion? Because like, I see Josh Allen after the game. He's like, you know, it's just another win. It's a week 11 win, whatever. But that's got to feel pretty good to knock off Kansas City from their unbeaten streak. So here's I, this gets thrown out a lot in, in coach speak and like, you know, like players, the cliches that like you kind of say. I sh- I truly believe that, and it starts with Coach McDermott, his ability to be able to ground everybody regardless of who we're playing is incredible. His ability to say, guys, like, we are process-oriented. It doesn't matter who we're playing. We, we, we understand and we respect the opponents. We know, you know how to attack, how to prepare, et cetera. But at the end, it's about us. It's about how we play, how we prepare, how we practice, how we recover leading up to the game. And during the game, you again, you have awareness to what they're doing. But how do you execute within, like, the play that's called? All 11 guys being on the same – like, I truly believe that that this building, the Bills building, does an incredible job of that. So to your point, was it a big game? Absolutely. Um, But – it wasn't bigger than any other game that we've played, at least internally, maybe the outside, maybe, you know, like kind of, uh, revs revs it up to be a little bit more, but internally we were really focused on just kind of, how do we maximize our abilities, play the best football we can execute at a high level. And at the end of the, at the end of the game, if we do that, you know, we can live with the result because our process was sound leading into that. Is this, to me, as an outsider, as a passive fan, this to me seems like a huge rivalry game without kind of maybe it being a rivalry game. Is that the same? Like, do you guys feel that type of, like, intensity previous, like, when you're you're going into the Chiefs week? I think that any time you play, like, in that primetime window, you can just kind of feel that electricity in the air, in the the stadium, like – regardless of kind of the opponent opponent you're playing. Um, like I think of like the Monday night games I played, the Thursday night games I played, there's just something about playing in those windows that is just really fun and exciting. Um, but to the rivalry, like it's hard for me to say, like, again, are, is it, is it bigger than, you know, the dolphins game? Like that's a huge rivalry too, for bills fans. Sure. Um, Fish the fish. Yeah. So, you know, to me, to me, like I, we try to approach 
specifically too with the O-line, like we try to approach this as like how, how you practice is how you play. This game isn't bigger than another game. And cause I think that if you do that, if you make it bigger than another game, um, you start to do things that you're not really accustomed to doing or what you practice. So how can you make everything kind of look the same, feel the same, do everything kind of the same in your preparation during the week? So that Sunday it's, it feels, you know, like any other day. So you, you talked about how coach McDermott has really sort of like put up that foundation for success. And obviously that's been echoed through coach Brady, Josh and stuff like that. What for you, if, you know, I'm kind of going to fl- flip it over to the Badgers here, uh, for a second if what was something that either like josh or uh coach mcdermott has taught you that you would like if you were talking to the badgers right now you would want to relay to them about either football or leadership or how to comport yourself as a professional football player yeah um i i feel like i take it like i hear a lot of the criticisms when i see like former players or, you know, people talk about Wisconsin. And I feel like I take a little bit of a different approach in terms of like, we are all trying, we're rooting for that program, those players to have success. You know, like I, I want Jack Nelson to be a first team all American win the outland, you know um, I want Tyway Walker to, to win the, like, I want all those guys to have success. And um. I can remember last year with the bills being five and five and six and six. And it was, it was kind of similar in terms of the, the record you would say to Wisconsin right now. And going back to like that process of who cares what everybody else is saying, you know, what really matters are the guys in this locker room, the coaches that you have, you know, your families, like, that's it. Like who cares what everybody else is kind of saying that's negative. That's trying to like bring the program down or whatever. Like, and I, you know, I look back to last year at that time when we were five and five and six and six. And it was like, I I really felt strongly we were a good team and maybe our record didn't reflect that at that time. And then we rattled off, you know, five in a row to win the division. So, you know, like, how can you stay internal and inside out rather than outside in and looking for, you know, all those different things to, I guess, make you feel better. Um, But like, I look at Wisconsin right now, like um, the strength of their offense right now is their O-line and running backs. Like that hasn't changed from when I was there, Bernie, when you were there, like, Mm -hmm. you know, they have something. and, And I think too, they played great defense against, two really premier offenses in Oregon and Penn state. There's a lot of positives that you can point to in this program and say, guys, like we're not making anything up to be able to go out there and try to win games. Like these guys have put it on film, have done a good job. Maybe the result isn't what they want, but let's not get discouraged by, you know, maybe not getting the job done against Oregon or Penn state at home. We're right there. How do we continue to grow and evolve and, and try to, again, stay inside out process oriented so that the result kind of takes care of itself. David, to me, the locker room feels more rotational, like more guys in and out kind of maybe like the NFL. Do you, do you think there's a comparison of you got guys drafted, you got guys coming in free agent. Now you, you might sit in the locker room and the guys next to you could leave for in the transfer portal and have two brand new guys. Like, when I played, you had we had what one transfer guy, Matt Perkins, right. Alex Lewis, is that right? And then Brian Calhoun, and then Calhoun. So we had two. Sorry. So like you can't even remember them, and they're so little. Like the amount of guys who would leave and come, but then you would you would recruit young guys. But that's why I was saying um, I've said this before. It's like you you could win these big games because you had the ten guys on the offense played number of years together, um, and you had that core and you had the culture and the whole nine. But is is college like the NFL now where guys are in and out of the locker room and, and how difficult is that? I think it's difficult for sure. Um is it like the NFL? I think in some ways it is, in some ways it isn't. The business side, I'm sure, is a lot different, you know, like being able to 
whatever the NIL collectives that are, you know, paying guys to, to play. Um, but that there's no contract, there's no commitment. You know, you can leave and, and hop in the portal, you know, after the season and it's, it's not a big deal. Right. So I, I think this, like, I saw Tom Brady talk about like when he went to Michigan, he was part of a program. Like he was part of a developmental program where from the day he stepped in to the day he left, he was part of a culture. He was part of a a class that he came in with where those were your guys. And so, and now it's not so much like that. There is more of a premium on this win now mentality and how can I, as a player, maximize my earning potential, whether that's, you know, at Wisconsin or another school elsewhere. So the challenge I feel like for college coaches, and I don't know if you guys agree, is how do you surround your your team, your locker room? How do you get guys that are kind of in the same mentality of, hey, we're all in this together. You may not have success. That doesn't mean you should leave. You know what I mean? So how do you get guys that are kind of similar in that mindset that, you know, like we're all in this together, we're going to stick to it, you know, and, and be in it for the long haul rather than the short term. I think one of the, the hardest parts about that though, is that we've seen the escalation in coach movement, right. Over the past 10, 15 years. And I think it's harder to establish that culture of consistency, right. That you're talking about when you have three, four, five position coaches, changing every single year yeah you can have like that head coach at the top but bernie i mean you've mentioned you had brian white for five years right i mean uh david what did you have one offensive line coach two offensive line coaches maybe in your in your four years exactly right when guys have had three different position coaches in three years four different you know this is now going to be this weekend i think is like the fourth play caller in four years for this offense and yeah it's a bunch of different guys but i still imagine now again this is me i'm not inside the locker room but i imagine it's a lot tougher to do that when a lot of those guys uh that are you know in you know i don't want to call it middle management as a position coach but in some ways you are right you're between the players the workforce and the ceo of the head coach and so like i would imagine that makes it tougher to really get that going i think that college like what part of the as I reflect on why I felt like I had success at Wisconsin or why Wisconsin in general had success, there was a consistency through coaches, players, staff that you felt throughout your entire time there. I had one offensive line coach. I had one strength coach. I had one head coach. There was consistency in the, in the messaging. You knew exactly what to expect when you showed up on the first day of winter conditioning, spring ball, summer, you know, fall camp, et cetera. I think that matters. I really do. Like to be able to maximize yourself as a player, as a student, what, like if you're, if you're receiving the same sort of messaging, you know what to expect. You, you know, you have the same drills and individual for four years, you're probably going to develop and have more success over a long period of time. When you break that and you have change and you have, not to say that you can have success, but maybe it's a little bit more difficult, right? Like Coach Alvar has always said, like you grow through change, through change, and it couldn't be more true. But I also think that you can also have a lot of growth and consistency. You, 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 I, I actually thinking back now, the stability, right? Like I walked into the building and I never felt things were off in any type. I'm not saying that they're doing that. I'm just saying I knew exactly what I was getting, David, as you were saying. When I walked in at 6 o'clock in the morning, I knew what that lift was. I knew how hard I needed to work. I knew exactly what we were doing, and I knew how I was going to get coached. Then you almost can self-coach yourself through some of these things, and that is a big deal. And then at practice, same thing, same coach, same technique stuff. And you – not listen, not saying if Coach White left my last year, I would have been any – I probably would have been worse, but who knows? I could have got a guy who's like, you fix this one thing and you're be an NFL guy for 10 years. Who knows if that's true, but the consistency and knowing and being able to, in my head, think about how I made that mistake and think about how coach white would coach me. I think those things merit, you know, they're important. Um, 
I will say that, uh, you know, with what the Badgers have done, I think they're, that's what Fickle wants. I mean, I think he wants to build that culture. I think it will take longer due to NIL and due to the transfer portal. Um, and listen, you, you know, firing coaches is, is difficult. I'm sure, David, you've been around that or seen that happen a number of times. You had your offensive coordinator fired last year in the middle of the year. There you go. So, like, these things are difficult to rally around. And, uh, like, look at the Jets. They're going to be a rebuilding for 10 more years. Like, they've they've dug themselves a grave that is too – no one can get out of – what did Little Wayne say? Without a, a space shuttle or a ladder, that's forever. That's my one of my favorite lines. Because um, the Jets can't get out of this. I, I feel horrible for them. Not, neither here nor there. We're talking about the Badgers. Okay, I have a Badgers question. I do I too. A but question. okay, go, Matt Burke, go You go it. first. No, Bernie, I'm, I'll pass it. Back I have more of an O line question. Great, I love it. Let's okay. do it. So David Edwards, I don't know if you saw, it, but Urban Meyer said it's almost impossible to find linemen now. Everything's so heavy on skill um, across the board, and there's a lot more skill guys, I guess, in the pool. How important is it now, if you're a lineman, to dig into that and be like, I want to stay here, I want to play O-line, and I can make a living doing this? I think there are talented linemen everywhere. Like, is it harder to maybe develop guys? There's more of a premium on skill guys. Like, you can make that argument, but... But like I look at, um, I look at like Wisconsin. They still have had uh, a really good unit, you know. Even though they've had a lot of change over the last three or four years, like you got what you've been talking about. So, how do you develop? Got that's the key, I think, is the weight room stuff specifically in college. The weight room stuff, the development with your O line coach, right? But then there's also a tie-in. I think this kind of gets overlooked is the style of offense that you play in. Like, are you just a drop back team? Are you an RPO team? Are you a heavy run set personnel where you have, you know, gap downhill? Do you have a great running back? You know, there's so many factors at play. I feel like when it comes to developing great offensive linemen that kind of gets overlooked. How does the quarterback uh, uh, feel pressure? Does he get rid of the ball? Does he run? Does he uh, just take sacks? Like the development of offensive line play, I think is not so it's, it's more than just, is he a good player? Is he a five-star? Is he a three-star? Like how do you make the offensive line work in tandem with the running backs, the tight ends, the quarterbacks. And like, I think of, my time at Wisconsin with Jonathan Taylor, he was so special and made us right in so many ways that we looked good. Were we that good? Was I that? I don't know. I don't, maybe, maybe I wasn't, but he was so good that he made us look so good. Um, His ability to cut, his ability to run, his ability to lower his shoulder. Like there's so many different factors at play. So you mentioned JT one year before JT, you know, with Wisconsin playing Nebraska this weekend, I, I had to go back and look at that 2016 uh, Nebraska game, the overtime win. Uh, I think Wisconsin was like 11th. Nebraska was seventh, something like that. Like both really, really highly rated teams. That was your first year starting. Um, yeah. if, if I recall correctly, I think you were at right tackle. Do you remember that game and what it was and what that one was like? Cause I remember Dare scores the game winning touchdown in overtime. And that's what was one of my favorite regular season games of the past decade. I can't lie. Yeah, that was actually my first career start. Um, and it was Halloween um, that night. Um, I can remember uh, that game. And again, like another primetime night game, it just felt different. You know, like the atmosphere, the electricity in the air, the stadium. Um, two big time teams, top, you know, 11 matchup, whatever it was. Um, I can remember Bradrick Shaw taking a, like an untouched touchdown. Um, we ran kind of like an inside zone, um, that he took to the house. Um, I think Foom had a big catch, uh, in that game. Um, I can remember like that. Yeah. When Dari scored, like just the, the energy and excitement behind that. Um, what a, this matchup too as I look back 
really since Nebraska came into the Big Ten, has always been kind of like a big game in terms of like the the schedule, like you know, implications or whatever. And and, and last year for Wisconsin became bowl eligible, like kind of similar situation this year. So I'm excited to kind of see um, you know, the game and and what happens because you know, I, I, I really feel like the change that was made with the OC and stuff, like guys are going to rally and they're going to be ready to play. And I'm excited to kind of see what that looks like. Well, David, you mentioned before, to me, this is a throw out all the stuff that doesn't work. You know, you mentioned having your full playbook. I think this is completely the opposite. It's uh, you're not going to have your full playbook. You should only have 50%. The stuff that works, works. We need to do. Is that is that something you're maybe with some variants, right? Is that something that you would suggest that the Badgers do with a, a brand new guy? <laughs> I uh, here's what I think is going to happen. Um, I think going back to what we were talking about earlier, the strength of this offense is their offensive line and their running back so, and running backs plural. So, if I were to guess, I bet, and I would, you know, to to make a prediction, I would say that they're going to try to be more physical than Nebraska, mm-hmm. try to run the football more, um, and, and, and try to alleviate a little bit of more, you know, a little more stress off of, of Braden Locke. So, um, again, I'm excited to kind of see how they rally, uh, around their new OC, their new play caller, because, um, you know, they still have a lot to play for, like mm-hmm. another chance to go to a bowl game. Um, and, and to extend their season, like that's, that's going to be, you know, a huge factor for a lot of these guys in that locker room. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, the vibes are definitely going to be changing in there with, uh, with a new offensive coordinator. Um, but from afar, one of my favorite things about this Buffalo season has been the vibes with you guys with Mr. Brightside, because (laughs) I got to talk to you about this. I I, I got to talk to you about this because this is just one of the best things that's been happening all the time. Um, A, where did this come from? B, does anyone get more hyped than Dalton Kincaid? No, no. <laughs> he How loves did it too. for you guys? Like, where did this all come from? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I think you. <laughs> I think that we have to be winning a certain amount in the fourth quarter for it to be played at a certain point in the game. But I don't know, to be honest. But if you look at me and, and Connor McGovern, 66, like, I don't know if we get to it or if you could see it. <laughs> like, I'm like, everyone's dancing, having a good time. And I think Connor and I are, like, talking about, like, what the defense is going to do next. Like, we're not really. <laughs> sometimes sometimes I wish I would look around and kind of enjoy those moments a little bit more. But you're so hyper-focused in those moments to be like, all right, what's next? Like, what are we going to get next, you know? Yeah, I I, I can imagine. It's just, I got to say, when you guys, when Josh scored the (laughs) touchdown last weekend and then it came on in the stadium, just like watching on TV, like, I'm in my house. It's my birthday weekend and I'm absolutely losing my mind, like, staying along. (laughs) It's freaking amazing, dude. I don't know. Can you guys hear that on the broadcast? Yeah. Like, do they show that? That's cool. Yeah, yeah, I've seen it on the broadcast awesome. a couple of times. It's, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, like we're just sitting there, standing there like, all right, what are we going to get next on this defensive <laughs> look? <laughs> you know, sometimes, I, again, we wish we'd kind of enjoy the moment a little bit. Well, next time, ne- next time you've got a home game, uh, think about it, look up and say Bernie and Perko reminded you to, to take yeah. a look. And, just uh, take uh, one moment to look around. Yeah, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna get you out of here on one Buffalo food question because we're you know it's it's Buffalo. Everyone has a different answer for that top okay. top three spots in Buffalo to eat. You and your wife are going out to dinner. Where are you guys going? Oh man! All right, number one, number one is gonna be Lucia's. Lucia's okay. on the lake. Love right. Lucia's. Um, number two. Is going to be mulberries. Oh, I've been mulberries. Um, mulberries is good. Yeah. We, um, every Friday, I'll get, I'll give you number three in a sec. Every Friday, I try to, um, 
take my daughters and go to like a different restaurant in, um, you know, the Buffalo area, we just like mm-hmm. order takeout and it's kind of like our special time of the week where we kind of hang out and whatever. So, um, number three is going to be Giancarlo's. Mm. Those are my top three, Lucia's, Mulberries, and Giancarlo's. And I do love, there's a wing spot called Wing Nuts. I don't know if Matt, if you've heard of it. Oh, I have not. It is incredible. I absolutely love, absolutely love it. It's so good. All right. What's your daughter's favorite? What are your daughter's favorite place? My daughter's definitely Giancarlo's because we get their, um, uh, we get their pizza and they crush, <laughs> they crush their pizza. <laughs> so they love it, which is awesome. Bernie, I'm sure your girls would be doing the same very soon. I'm taking my daughter to pizza. And she, we go to pizza store. That's what she calls it. So we're going there today. <laughs> She's horrible it. at eating at the store, though, or at the restaurant. She just hangs out and wants to talk to people and run around. Sometimes it's just the experience. You know what I mean? I just am like, give me the pizza in a box and I'll let her eat it at a table. If, if <laughs> yeah. she wants to like, if don't she give wants. me plates and silverware or anything. <laughs> I just need a ton of napkins. <laughs> bring the wet that. wipes and uh, it's yeah. gonna be a mess that's it it's gonna be a mess in a 45 minutes of my my um stress level being elevated yeah. but after that i'll eat pizza and be happy yeah well oh, bernie man. i will say these 45 minutes have not been a mess they have been absolutely fantastic we cannot <sighs> thank they go by David. so fast they go by so fast i've you know they i always ask a million more questions uh <laughs> but we'll just save that for part three is what we'll have there to you go. do I love um it. david we can't thank you enough for taking some time during your obviously very busy schedule glad we're able to catch you on a bye week um you know obviously let's go buffalo forever go bills go bills um <laughs> we want to thank everyone tuning in here to believe in badgers not believe in bills although you should be tuning in to believe in bills if you are a bills fan <laughs> nonetheless we're here on believe in badgers on the believe network presented by betonline.ag and oak bridge wealth management thanks again for tuning in and until next time on wisconsin on wisconsin appreciate you guys thanks for having me